prepare ourselves if you put your hand over your eyes. I open my eyes to see the spiritual truth today. I open my ears to hear the spiritual truth today. Now we cover your heart and just extend out your arms. I open my heart to receive the spiritual truth today. All right. The spiritual truth that I'm talking about today is that within you, you have all of the power of the universe. All of the power of the universe is within you. All the power that God used to create this universe is within you. All of the power that Jesus had to heal the sick is within you. All of the power in the universe is within you right now. Now those words, I'm taking them from the textbook of Ernest Holmes in Science of Mind, the textbook that we listen to and we read and study from here. But no, make no mistake, Ernest Holmes took it from all of the spiritual masters. He took it from Jesus. He took it from Buddha. He took it from Lao Tzu and all the other spiritual masters who understood that that power that is creative is within each and every one of us. Now, in the textbook, when Ernest Holmes wrote, the power of the universe is within you, the next sentence was, we need to know it, we need to feel it, and then we need to act from it. We need to know that the power of the universe is within us. We need to feel that power of the universe that is within us. And then, most importantly, we need to act from it. And when we begin to act from it, lives can change, not only ours, but others. When we act from it, we understand that we can create the kind of life we want with our, our partners. We can be the kind of parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles that can helpful, helpful, help successfully navigate our kids in understanding and decoding this life. When we understand it, we feel it, we act from it, we can create the kind of jobs we want that make us feel we're contributing to the whole, that we're contributing to the entire world. That's what happens when we absolutely understand it. And when we feel it, and we know it, and we act from it, we stop paying dues to the victim club. Yes. We begin to understand, amen? Yes. See, when we can do that, then we understand why we're here. And why we're here, as Jerry and, and okay. Esther Hicks said, we have everything we need. We, we understand we came here to be abundant people, to be creative people, to be compassionate people, to be loving people. That's what our job here on earth is to do. And when we're in touch with the power of the universe, that's when we can actually do it. We can step out of ourselves and begin to learn it. You know, several of us, Donna and I and, and Patrice uh, and uh, a couple of other people, uh, uh, Prim Turner, we all went to hear Joe Dispenza for five days. And Joe Dispenza, yeah, Joe Dispenza's uh, uh, theory is this. He actually is putting science to what Jesus taught us. And what he says is inside of us, we have an apothecary that will solve any health issues we have inside of us. And while we were there, we heard a testimonial of a woman who had for 50 years lived in absolute back pain. And not 50, 30 years. 30 years absolute back pain. And she had done everything. She had had surgeries. She did medications. She did all of the uh, uh, Eastern modalities you could think of. She went to Brazil to be with John of God. She did everything she could think of. And she was still in pain. Her life had gotten very small. She was in, uh, 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 she was taking Vicodin and, and, and uh, Oxy every single day just to get through the day. Barely got out of the house. And then she got one of Joe Dispenza's books. And Joe Dispenza's whole life is teaching us how to access this power. Yeah. See, the thing about the power is we can know it's there intellectually, and that means we know about it. Yeah. But what we want to do is know it. Not about it, but know it. Yeah. So that we can actually begin to use it in our life. And she did that. She started the meditations. And she said, even when she sat down, sometimes she was feeling that she was just saying things and just hearing things, but she kept at it day after day, week after week, 
month after month until she was completely healed. Yeah. Yeah. And now she has no medication. Yeah. And we met her at that, that conference and we saw her and we saw how active she was and how she was able to move with freedom in her life and hope in her life. It took a minute, but she got there because she kept doing it over and over again. Now, my hope is that all of us can begin to familiarize ourselves with Joe Dispenza's work. But until it happens, we have some spiritual practices we can do to release the flow. Because here's the thing, all we're doing is blocking the flow. If we're not feeling it, if we're not acting from it, we're just blocking it. And so there are some things we can do to help block unblock that flow and one of them comes from this book called uh, and, and the spiritual practice is fail fast fail often now it comes from a book uh, by that name fail fast fail often how losing can help you win now I actually bought this book just for myself and another person I didn't buy it for the whole congregation but you know once I get into something and I figure you know what this might be helpful to more people than just me and my friend then I have to bring it to the church so uh, so that you get to hear a little bit about this uh, yourself although it's counterintuitive the thesis is this and I believe it now the thesis is this people who fail fast and fail often are more likely to succeed than people who don't. People who fail fast and fail often are more likely to succeed than people who don't. So let me give you a little, uh, just a little uh, story that they've got in the beginning of the book, first part of the book. Uh, in, in they, they reference another book called Art and Fear. The artist uh, Ted or Orland and David Wyland share a story about a ceramics teacher who tried an experiment with his class. The teacher divided the students into two groups. Those sitting on the left side of the studio were graded solely on the quantity of their work, while those on the right side swole solely on the quality of their work. The instructor informed the students in the quantity group that a simple rule would be applied to evaluate their grades. Those who produced 50 pounds of pots would get an A. Those who produced 40 pounds, a B, and so on. For the quality group, the instructor told the students he would assign a course grade based on a single best piece produced over the duration of the course. So if a student created a first-rate pot on day one of the course and did nothing for the rest of the term, he would still get an A. When the end of the quarter arrived and it came to grading time, the instructor made an interesting discovery. The students who created the best work as judged by technical and artistic sophistication were the quantity group. While they were busy producing pot after pot, they were experimenting, becoming more adept at the work with clay and learning from the mistakes on each progressive piece. In contrast, the students of the quality group carefully planned out each pot and tried to produce refined, flawless work. And so they worked only on a few pieces over the length of the course. Because of their limited practice, they showed little improvement in their life. Yeah. See, successful people take action quickly, quick, even if they perform badly. Instead of trying to avoid mistakes, they actively seek out mistakes so they can face where their shortcomings are. That's, good. That's, good. That's a powerful thing. That's good. Yeah, isn't that good? Yeah. Yes. When we, when we face our mistakes, then we begin to learn where our skill set shortcomings are and where knowledge is, is coming from. They understand. They understand that feeling afraid and unprepared is a sign that we've created a space in which growth can happen. See, mistakes, when we recognize we're making a mistake, instead of fearing them, we need to see them as we've just created a space in which growth can happen. Yes. Contrast with unsuccessful people who are afraid, who are afraid to make that choice. And what happens when they make a choice and they fail? What happens is they begin to readdress their plans. They begin to think they made a mistake. They question their motives. And we've all done that. They plan, and, and the, those people who have 
who have actually gone ahead and make the mistake, they push through. And you've probably all felt that, where you've pushed through a, mis a period of mistake making, and you felt really proud because you pushed through it. And you were able to do something that felt good and felt wonderful for you. When we encounter accomplished people in art, in music, in business, we often attribute their accomplishment to their brilliance. But from this day forward, we might want to look at, at attributing their accomplishments to the number of mistakes they were willing to make in their life. And if we could do that, see, things don't become manifest perfectly the first time. It takes a while to refine that. The truth is, most success comes after failures. They cite another example in this book uh, from Starbucks. Howard Schultz, creation of Starbucks, provides a good example of how success arises from many mistakes. When Schultz first formed Starbucks, he had the idea of modeling the stores after Italian coffee shops, which provide a new experience for customers in the United States. Although Schultz's idea was a good starting point, the Starbucks coffee shops today have little resemblance to the initial concept. In fact, many things were wrong with his idea. In the original store, the baristas wore bow ties. The menus were primarily in Italian, which annoyed customers. <laughs> Non-stop opera music played in the background. There were no chairs, and non-fat milk was not served. The coffee shops of today evolved through thousands of mistakes, experiments, adjustments, and revisions along the way. But it couldn't, and look how successful Starbucks is today. They're yeah. just, and they're everywhere. They were willing to make those mistakes and not give up to move on. The key to success can be as simple as failing fast and failing quickly. You know, the great comedians, Chris Rock, Jerry Seinfeld, Wanda Sykes, what they do is they don't go on to HBO with their first set. They go to thousands, not thousands, but lots. I tend to exaggerate. <laughs> They go to many, many small clubs, and they they pull out their all their story, all their jokes, and the ones that fly they take to HBO, and the ones that were mistake they just leave them in the small, but they're willing to take them out yeah. and float them to see what is going to work in their life. <laughs> see, they're not afraid. Great Buddha, Lord Buddha, you know the same thing happened with him. He didn't have the middle way. He didn't engage in enlightenment in the, what's called the middle way, which is actually the third way. The great Lord Buddha experienced great opulence, and he didn't, that wasn't for him. And then he experienced great denial, and that wasn't for him. And from those two ways of being, and experiencing those two ways of being, and deciding those weren't the right ways of being, he found the middle way. And when he found the middle way, he found enlightenment. But he wasn't willing, he wasn't unwilling to keep trying yeah. in his life. Yeah. See, if, if we expect, accept the notion that we fail fast, fail often, that leads to success, that's what's going to happen. If you want to write great poetry, you need to write a lot of bad poetry yeah. on your way to great poetry. If you want to speak Chinese, you need to speak a lot of bad Chinese. <laughs> on your way to great Chinese. Because you can't do it otherwise. You won't be successful otherwise. See, we have to be willing to less, look less than brilliant. And that's what stops us. We don't want to look like we're not smart.